This is a documentary about family archives and their importance for studying the life and work of women designers between 1918 and 1945. The case presented is the family archive of a Dutch female graphic designer, Tina Baanders, who was active from about 1910 to 1960. Few women designers and architects published in official magazines in this period, and even fewer wrote books on their own work. Family archives can therefore be an important resource in reconstructing their lives and work. This case illustrates how such an archive was kept and, much later, used for research. This archive does not only contain information on this particular designer, but also gives an insight into the context of her work and of that of some other female designers. The present archive consists mainly of photographs and letters which were kept by Tina's family. Tina Banders, who lived from 1890 to 1971, was the youngest of the eight children of Amsterdam architect H. H. Banders and his wife Lena Banders van den Berg. Two of Tina's brothers, Herman and Jan, also became architects. Tina was a flamboyant person. Never to be overlooked at parties, her optimism and humour attracted many people, including her female lovers. Openness about lesbian sexuality was rare in those days, apart from a small circle of artists in Amsterdam. Driving across Europe in sports cars on her holidays in the 1920s and 30s was one of the remarkable aspects of her lifestyle. After Tina's death in 1971, the archival material was safeguarded by the sculptor Nina Banders Kessler, wife of Tina's nephew. Nina was one of the few family members at the time who realised the historical value of this material. She brought together not only photos and letters of Tina, but also of some of her sisters and brothers, and of Tern Timner, a painter and female partner of Tina. The current owner of this family archive is Nina's son, Ambrosius Banders. This family archive forms the basis for this documentary. The archive consists of hundreds of letters and thousands of photographs. The total volume of the documents is around eight 100-litre cardboard boxes. The current owner is supported by other family members in the study, classification and scanning of the material. It is kept in private homes and not under official archiving conditions. The family archive contains a large amount of negatives. Although not many people were aware in the past of the importance to keep negatives of photos, there are many in this collection. Tern Timner was a keen amateur photographer who had her own darkroom and followed several photography courses. This may have inspired Tina and other family members to keep the negatives. Since the advent of digital age, it has become easier for private persons to scan documents and to post-process the scans of photo prints and negatives. Scans from negatives give better results than scans from printed photos. But many of the negatives have scratches, so post-processing is often necessary to get presentable results. Photoshop and similar programs make this possible for amateurs. The material can then be presented in near-perfect quality, as in this documentary. It soon became clear to the owner of the collection that to identify the people and understand the scenes in the photos, information from the letters was necessary. The text written on the back of some photographs, or on the original envelopes that contained some of the negatives, give a few hints, but the written letters are often the only source for determining the dates of the photographs. The owner began to make an inventory of all documents and photos in the form of a chronological timeline. This is still in progress. Around the year 2000, a few art and design historians began to show interest in Tina's work and her role in the artist community of Amsterdam of the period. After contacting the owner of the family archive, they were given access to the material and used it for their work, resulting in five books and three exhibitions. Scans from photos were used as well as quotes from the artist's letters. Most of the photos proved to be unique. In some cases, the historians could hardly find any other personal photos showing their subjects. The research projects of the design historians are shown here. Firstly, a thesis on Tina's book cover designs, published in 2003. 
Secondly, a study of the first female book publishers in the Netherlands, Tine van Klooster and Koos Schigardes, with an exhibition in 2005. Thirdly, a dissertation on Dutch female designing artists between 1880 and 1940, published in 2007. Fourthly, a book on the life and work of painters Elseberg and Mommy Schwartz, with a following exhibition held in a Jewish historical museum of Amsterdam in 2012. And finally, a book on the life and work of the modern dance pioneer Gertrude Leistikow, followed by an exhibition held in 2014. These people were close friends of Tina, and the archive provided valuable information on them. As said, one of these projects is the dissertation by Marianne Groot, who studied 566 women active in the Netherlands as designers in many fields between 1818 and 1940. In this picture, the yellow markers show each of the pages where Tina Baanders is mentioned. It gives an idea of the extensive use Groot made of the archive. Had only public archives been available, Tina Baanders would only have occupied a limited space in Groot's work. Groot particularly valued the information she could derive from the personal letters to and from Tina. Using quotes from letters from the archive, she illustrates how women could function as designers in a world dominated by men. Tina Baanders had a relatively extensive education in arts and crafts. When her father died in 1905, her brother took over the architect's office and he and other brothers helped finance her education. At the age of 16, in 1906, she entered the arts and crafts school Quellinius in Amsterdam, from which she graduated in 1909 with a silver medal. Her principal subjects were decorative drawing and lithography, the other subjects were drawing from life, history of architectural styles, anatomy and proportions, and projection and perspective. After that, in 1909 and 1910, she attended the bookbinding class at a school called the Daytime Drawing and Arts and Crafts Schools for Girls, DKM in Dutch. She also followed evening classes on drawing from life. This photo, which is clearly staged, shows each girl working at a different stage of bookbinding. Early in 1911, the family arranged for Tina to go to Zurich with her friend Kato Berlage. They would attend a summer class on book design at the Kunstgewerbeschule in Zurich. Kato was the daughter of H.P. Berlage, one of the most important architects in the country at that time. Berlage and Tina's brother Herman made the arrangement. The girls, who were 20 and 21 years old, went to Switzerland in April 1911. At the time, it was not that common for girls to study abroad, and the good names of their brother and father as architects surely played a role in getting this opportunity. After the summer, the families decided that both girls could go back to Zurich for a full year's course. At the end of November 1911, Tina got a job as lithographer at the Grafische Anstalt Wolfensberger. This firm was a well-known producer of posters and other commercial art, which still exists today. Tina got a full-time job here, and she gave up her classes. But the friend Kato continued and finished her classes in April 1912. These are some examples of commercial designs that Tina made at Wolfensberger. They are designs for lithos. In a letter to her mother, she gave an elaborate description of her working day and convinced her mother that she was not working in a factory among labourers. She writes, It is a very large and spacious room, with five very large windows, partitioned by three casements. Our working tables are near the windows, seven in a row, and I am sitting at the fourth. Above the tables, neat electric lamps with nice white muslin shades. To the left of us, there are three large easels on which are placed the sheets that we have to work with. The other half of the room is occupied by long tables, where the wrapping is done, and the girls are sitting for the binding. Tina and Kato returned to Amsterdam in the summer of 1912, mainly because the amount of work at Bovensberger had diminished. A year later, in September 1913, Tina was admitted, after an examination, to the prestigious Rijksakademie voor Beeldende Kunsten in Amsterdam, the National Academy for Fine Arts. Her main subjects were drawing and painting. 
She graduated in 1917. Volk, who studied the book cover designs by Tina Banders, traced about 50 books by her, published by about 10 publishers. Almost all designs are based on the form of the letters in the title. Other illustrations were rarely used. She used different scripts, mostly based on the Roman and Ancial script, but sometimes the letters were of her own design, related to the Amsterdam school. The books were mostly found in libraries, only a few copies can be found in the family archive. Tina was the only woman to design four covers for the famous magazine Wendingen of the Amsterdam School, edited by the architect Hendrik Weideveld. The Amsterdam School is a Dutch variant of Art Deco architecture and design. Here we see a cover of the issue of Wendingen, featuring the buildings designed by the architect Michel de Klerk, written by his colleague Piet Kramer. It dates from 1924. The architect Michel de Klerk, who had worked closely with Tina's brothers Herman and Jan, was one of the most gifted architects of the Amsterdam School. He died young in 1923, and Wendingen dedicated four issues to his work. This is the cover of the issue of Wendingen about new ceramics, from 1927. In it, Tina uses the abstraction of the form of a teapot. After their return to Amsterdam from Zurich in 1912, both Tina and Cato Berlage started to work at making designs for an exhibition that was to be held the following year, called The Woman 1813-1913. This was at the occasion of the centenary of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. It was showing the progress women had made in their role in society and included the products of many female artists and craftswomen. Both girls also entered a competition for the poster design of the exhibition, but it was won by Willy Drupstein, with whom Tina remained friends for many years. Cato Berlage was second in the competition, Tina ended lower. Both girls also made other designs for the exhibition. Letters in the family archives show that, in the 1920s, Tina helped collect funds to support Willy Drupstein, who was in financial difficulties because of ill health. One of Tina's designs was a commemorative certificate for the participants of the exhibition. This is the architect Margaret Kropholler's certificate, issued in the name of her pseudonym, Greta Derlinge. In 1917, Tina was asked by her brothers, the architects, to decorate the ceiling of a function room. This was in a large housing estate, which they were building for a shipyard in Rotterdam. We see her here on the scaffolding. Other designs produced by Tina Banders over the years included posters, security bonds, certificates, diplomas, charters, vignettes, logos, letterheads and ex libris. These are difficult to find in official archives, although there is one collection containing sketches and the family archive contains photos of diplomas and charters. Again, Tina used variations of the Roman and Ancial scripts Early in 1921, Tina designed a large poster for an exhibition about interior decoration, which was held in the Stedelijk Museum of Amsterdam. This was her first poster for public display. In letters to a friend, she writes how happy she was with the reactions. Some critiques were negative about the exhibition, but praised the poster. Tina writes, My big lithography is finished now, and is hanging here in several proofs, covering most of my walls. I look at it now and then, with a wonderful feeling. I do not think it is sublime, but I wouldn't feel worth much without my work. I worked at it with real energy, and it shows. It was so well received by my artist friends. Tina also designed the three logos that were used successively by the publishing house De Spiegel. This was the first Dutch publishing house run by women, namely her friends Tina van Klooster and Koos Gegardus. It was founded in 1926. 
Tina's involvement with women emancipation is further illustrated by the fact that she made a certificate for the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, which was presented to its founder Carrie Chapman Catt at her 70th birthday in January 1929. A photo of this is in the family archive. It shows a globe with Europe, Asia and Africa, while the alliance was mainly a North American and European affair. In 1919, Tina started teaching graphic design at the School for Decorative Arts and Crafts in Amsterdam, and she continued until her retirement in 1955. Today, this school is called the Rietveld Academie. Her subjects were bookbinding, calligraphy and letter design. In the 1920s and 30s, her teaching covered a day or less per week, but after 1945, this gradually increased to almost full-time, there is little information in official archives about who her students were. The only indication in the family archive are two photos of her class of 1951. In 1955, at age 65, Tina retired from the school. The festivities to bid her farewell showed that she was very popular at the school, especially among her colleague teaching artists. Items in the family archive are a testimony to this. Tina had many friends among the artist community in Amsterdam in the interbellum period. This is shown by the letters and photographs in the family archive. An inventory suggests that the majority of her friends were artists, including literary and performing artists. The following picture gives an illustration. Some have been used in the books and exhibitions mentioned earlier. This is a picture of the cottage in Schorl, some 50 kilometers north of Amsterdam, which Tina rented with the painters Elseberg and Mommy Schwartz, and where they spent many weekends and summer weeks in the early 1920s. We see the apple harvest in 1921, with Mummy Schwartz and Tina. In this picture, taken by Tina, the publishers Tina van Klooster and Koosje Garders are leaving the cottage on their motorcycle, after a visit. Elsa Berg is waving. This is a camping trip by Werry, made in 1921 by Tina and three friends, including Elsa Berg, on the river Vecht and the surrounding lakes south of Amsterdam. And this is a picture from the same rowing trip. All four ladies were in white dresses. This is another wary trip in 1927. On the left we see Tina, her friend Don Timner, and the two ladies from the publishing house. In the boat, on the left, are her brother and a sister of Tina, with their partners. This photograph shows a birthday party of Elseberg in February 1931. In the centre we see Tina and Elsa. The photo was taken by a newspaper photographer and made the headlines of the Sunday edition a few days later. In 1937, the dance pioneer Gertrude Leistikov left for a long trip to the Dutch Indies, now Indonesia, and Tina sat on the committee that organised her farewell party. This picture was taken on the stairs of the City Theatre in Amsterdam, where the event took place. In November 1942, Elsa Berg and Mumi Schwartz, who were Jewish, were deported by the Nazis to Auschwitz and murdered. The only personal effects that were left in their house was a tin box with letters and other papers. It contained many items related to the Banders family, showing how close the ties of friendships were with Tina's family. Some of the postcards and letters gave an insight in the dates and life of Tina. With information from the Banders family archive, the items in the box could be better documented. Tina and Tern Timner became partners in 1923. Although they were companions for life, they never lived together. Tern was a rather unsuccessful painter. But as she came from a rich family, she could live up the fortune she had inherited. It can be concluded from the letters that up to that time, Tina had the idea that, like her seven brothers and sisters, she should marry some day. Her family was worried that at the age of 32 she still did not have a husband, 
but she had rejected all the men who were interested, as can be seen from the letters. It seemed it was Stone who made her aware of what homosexuality was, and helped her accept the idea that she did not need to have a husband. After that, it seems the family also quickly accepted, and later reacted with understanding when some of their own children turned out to be homosexual. The German painter Dora Castell, Tina's other life companion, lived on the French Riviera in the late 1920s and early 30s. She moved to Amsterdam in 1933 and lived with Tina at least until the early 1950s. She was successful enough to be able to live modestly from her work. Tina had met Dora through Tone, who also had a relationship with her. Clearly, these relationships were not always exclusive, and the three also made many trips together. The family ties with the seven brothers and sisters remained very strong throughout their lives. Here we see a part of the family at Tina's birthday on the 4th of August 1923. Also present are Tone Timner and Elseberg. After the First World War, Tina developed a true passion for travelling. She loved to see beautiful things, art, architecture, landscapes and flowers. This was linked, as she saw it, to her rare talent to enjoy beautiful things. Her friends and lovers, Elsa Berg and Don Dimner, had a clear influence in this respect. Many photos and letters illustrate this. With the painter Elsa Berg, Tina made a long trip to Italy in 1921 and 22. The trip lasted at least four months. Meanwhile, a colleague took over her teaching at the School for Decorative Arts and Crafts in Amsterdam. On this trip, they were joined by Hanna Elkong, a photographer from Berlin, who later moved to Amsterdam and became well known for her portraits of performing artists. Here we see Hanna and Elsa, and the shadow of Tina, at the station square in Innsbruck, probably waiting for the next train. There are a few letters from this trip, but the main information comes from some 40 photo prints that Hannah must have given Tina afterwards. As they are not numbered, the order and timing had to be inferred from indicators like the clothes. Hannah probably made many more photos and gave only a selection to Tina. But some show her quality as a photographer, like this one, of the Piazza Bra in Verona. The ladies also visited Venice, as is testified by this picture. A collection of Hannah Alcon's work is kept at the Maria Austria Institute in Amsterdam, but there is no trace of these photos. Here we see Elsa and Tina and a gallant gondolier. The trip took much longer than Tina had planned. She therefore had to ask the director at her school for a longer leave. This was Joop Smits, who was a teacher in Zurich ten years earlier, and he consented. She also begged her brothers, the architects, for extra money. They protested, but eventually paid. The ladies must have stayed for over a month in Florence. Elsa painted, especially in the surroundings of the monastery Certosa del Galuzzo. Here we see Tina preparing lunch. This location, San Miniato al Monte, is well known to all visitors of Florence. Tina visited libraries and antique book collections to study the early Italian book covers. Most impressive was a visit to the collection of Mr. Leo S. Olski, who showed her written and early printed books, about which she wrote very enthusiastically to Joop Smits. She writes, Olski lives in a large house, or rather a palazzo, where there is a library containing selected specimens that are hardly ever reproduced and can seldom be seen. Oh, Job, how I was enjoying myself this morning in that library. Written books in the most primitive forms from the earliest times. A beautiful collection that shows the transition from the written book to the first printed ones. Fantastic to see how, to preserve the impression of the written book, some of the earliest printed ones had their initials and the margins coloured by hand and adorned by pen. This interesting photo by Hannah Elkon was taken in Siena.
the trip continued to Rome and Naples, and the furthest place on the trip was Amalfi. There is no information on the return trip, except that Elsa continued to the south of France, where she met with her husband Mommy Schwartz. Dina had to go back to her teaching in Amsterdam. The next year, 1923, Dina met Teun Timner. They shared a passion for travel and developed a passion for cars. As said, Teun came from a rich family and had already travelled a lot in youth, to luxurious destinations like Monton in the summer and Zermatt in the winter. She was accustomed to cars, as is illustrated in this photo of around 1916, in which she is at the wheel of her father's car, a heavy Belgian Minerva, normally driven by her father's chauffeur. In 1925, Tone bought her first car, a light sports car of the French make Amilcar. It had no hood and no doors. The ladies had to step over the sideboard. Tone is seen here handling the crank to start. In those days, cars were not yet used for long distances. The ladies used it mainly to make trips within the country, like this picnic trip. But in the following years, Tone started to use it for trips to Paris and then to the south of France. In a letter, she explains how the trip from there to Amsterdam takes about five days. And even though it can't have been very comfortable, she obviously enjoyed it. This was at a time that long-distance car travel and tourism were starting to develop, and Tone certainly was an early adopter. In 1929, Tone bought a new and faster Amilcar, and Tina took over the first Amilcar from her. In the new car, Tina and Tone made a long summer trip to Spoleto in Umbria, where a lady friend owned a house, and then to Roquebrun, on the French Riviera, where they had a good time, as is clearly shown in this picture. The next year, 1930, Tina replaced her Amilcar by a new one, also an Amilcar, but of a more comfortable type. It was a used car, but she was clearly proud of it. Together with Tone and another friend, she made a trip to Norway with it. Meanwhile, the city of Genoa became a new travel destination. Her sister Min and her brother-in-law Wim Schimmel moved there. He became the director for the Genoa office of a large Dutch shipping company that served the Dutch Indies, now Indonesia, and also a consul general. The photo shows their official residence, which was called Villa Olandini. In the summer of 1931, Tina drove to Genoa, accompanied by another friend, Ellen Kramer, daughter of the famous Amsterdam architect Piet Kramer. Here we see her at the south side of the St. Gotthard Pass in Switzerland, near Airolo. They stayed in the Villa Olandini for a few weeks. Here we see the two sisters at the beach. Tina visited Genoa many times in the 1930s. From Genoa, Tina and Ellen drove via the Italian Riviera to the French Riviera, where Tone had rented a villa with a beautiful view over the Mediterranean, in teul sur mer Dora Castel, who lived on the Riviera at the time, had also joined the party, as can be seen in this photo with the two Amilcars. Finally, a picture of Tina's holiday trip of 1936, which she made with Dora Castel. It is Ortisei in the Dolomites in northern Italy and shows how Tina is having coffee in style on a mountain hike. Early in 1940, a few months before the German invasion of the Netherlands, Tina moved from Amsterdam to a small village south of the city, Bambrugge, where she rented an 18th century house that was part of a farm. It had a large garden overlooking and bordering the river. Dora Castel followed her to this house and stayed with her well into the 1950s. In the garden there was a picturesque tea pavilion. Many of Tina's birthday parties were given here. During the occupation, Tina hid a few people who were prosecuted by the Nazis. This included her Jewish friend Elsa Berg, who later went back to her own home in Amsterdam and was arrested there. 
This scene is from the second birthday party in the garden after the war, in 1947. Tina lived here until 1968, a few years before her death in 1971. After the books and exhibitions based on material from this family archive, the logical next step was to make an exhibition of the work and life of Tina Banders herself. This small exhibition was prepared by a team of five relatives of Tina, all grandchildren of her brothers and sisters, and opened in March of this year in Museum Het Schip in Amsterdam. It brought together books, covers, posters, diplomas, certificates and other designs by Tina, personal photos and two slideshows illustrating her work and life. The team was supported by the museum staff and by some of the authors of the earlier books. The exhibition showed that it was possible to map Tina's life with relatively few gaps in the information, to identify the key events and to illustrate most of those events with a representative image. We see here part of an illustrated timeline from the exhibition. The family archive presented has an extremely large number of photographs and negatives and has an enormous amount of handwritten letters, some with both sides of a correspondence. It grew thanks to the relative wealth of Tina and her family and friends. This allowed them to document their lives. And it was safeguarded because family members realised the historical value of the material. Writing the history of women designers in the 19th and early 20th century is difficult because we often lack primary sources. When researchers have access to such family archives, this can importantly add to the information from archives in official institutes. The material presented nuances history in general. It adds more stories and other perspectives. Therefore, family archives can be extremely valuable for historical research. And for researchers, it is worth to try to find such privately kept source materials by contacting family members of women designers. <laughs>